So as discussed in previous videos, there are a number of anecdotal accounts from ancient times and even more modern times that relate the use of using sonic vibrations to overcome friction and even gravity. Now these accounts usually involve a source of the vibrations which include, include musical instruments, human voices, and human movements like stomping against the ground. I also discuss the possibility of utilizing the earth as a giant resonant cavity that could function to enhance the strength of these vibrations by several orders, rendering them strong enough to move multi-ton objects like monolithic multi-ton stones. In these cases, the medium of conduction of these vibrations was the air, the earth's surface, or both. But is there any other way in which sonic vibrations could be conducted? Well, anyone who has researched this subject has likely heard of John W. Keeley. Keeley allegedly reproduced many of these feats in modern times, which included gravity reduction, which resulted in reducing the effort taken to move and lift a heavy object to complete levitation via apparent repulsion against or negation of gravity itself. Again, the main difference in these accounts of Keeley's is that he apparently used a mysterious wire to convey the vibrations from the source to the object to be moved. This peculiar wire was said to be trinuan or composed of three different metals, namely gold, silver, and platinum. But can sound vibrations actually flow through a wire in any practical level? When we think of wires, we usually think of them as being solely a conduit for electrical rather than sonic vibrations. However, we all likely remember one of our first science experiments as kids in making toy phones composed of two cups and a string. Speaking into a cup at one end of the string incites vibrations in that cup which then travels through the string to the other end causing the second cup to vibrate thus reproducing the sound. In order for this to work well the string usually needs to have some tension in it, enhancing the compression waves. However, going back to the uh, descriptions of the demonstrations in which Keeley used this trinuan wire, there is no mention of the wire needing to be taut or have any tension. The wire is usually described as being attached to a source of vibration with the other end left to dangle until it is attached to the object to be affected either by a prefabricated connection point or simply tied around the object. As we can see here in a picture of Keeley's famous weights and jars experiment, the wire has considerable slack in it, no tension at all. So the question is, can a loose but solid wire transmit sound as well or better than a taut string or even a wire under tension? So what I'm going to do here is to demonstrate the ability of sound to travel through a uh, metal wire. So not the actual uh, electrical impulses, but the sound vibrations themselves using the wire as a medium. So what I have here is a stiff piece of wire. So a stiff piece of wire, uh, it's about two and a half feet long and it's attached just simply taped to the bottom of a of a cup so what I'm going to do is see if we can hear the sound coming from the uh, resonator right here which will be vibrating and vibrating at a frequency of about 52 Hertz and see if uh, we can hear it so I'll, I'll attach it right here so this is a magnet with steel wire so that it stay on there just like that So I'll activate the circuit. So we 
can see <clears throat> and so we can hear that the sound vibrations that are started here at the resonator uh, travel through the metal conduit and can be heard um, here at the collector which is uh, the cup Here I have a, a piece of 24 gauge uh, magnet wire which is attached to the resonator and I make sure that uh, there were curves in the wire and it's attached to the cup on the bottom and so let's see if the sound will travel through. see that sound vibrations can indeed travel through a solid wire just as implied in accounts of Keeley's sonic demonstrations so assuming that these accounts are true and knowing that sonic vibrations can travel through a wire whether that wire is under tension or not what would be some of the desirable characteristics of such a wire well the first obvious feature is that it should be created from materials that are excellent conductors of sound. The next quality is a type of durability that could endure repeated connections and tyings. With these parameters in mind, we might see how Keeley's gold, silver, and platinum wire might fit the bill, as gold and silver are two of the best conductors of both electricity and sound, while gold and platinum are both high in ductility and malleability which means that the wire will be able to endure repeated tyings and connections and bendings without being damaged. But did the metals of the trunion wire have any other physical or energetic qualities other than these more understood physical properties? Well, according to this document, the trunion wire is suggested to have had the ability to act on the chosen frequency itself. It suggests that three different metals could actually be used to differentiate one single frequency into additional frequencies of harmonic ratios. If true, this process could effectively make a chord from a single note. A chord being of course a note and two or more of its harmonics sounded simultaneously. Achilles spoke of objects as having, having mass chords rather than a singular resonant frequency. It actually says here that very high frequencies could be slowed down or di divided and subdivided to generate lower frequencies. But what are the principles which would make this possible? Well anyone who has witnessed someone temporarily increase the pitch of their voice at a birthday party by inhaling helium has seen firsthand how changing the medium through which sound waves travel can change aspects of the sound itself, in this case the frequency. In this particular case, the sound waves travel faster in helium, which is significantly lighter than air, and hence its molecules can vibrate more readily. We know that sound speed is related to wavelength and frequency by the following equation. And as the document points out, 
The wavelength of sound is related to the response dimensions of the vocal cords. So if the speed of the sound is increased while the wavelength remains the same, then the frequency or pitch aspect must increase in response to the increase in travel speed. We can apply the same property of sound vibrations to Keeley's wire. We can safely assume that each of the three individual wires will have been the same length, and thus all three will have responded to the same wavelength. The frequency of sound in each wire would then depend on the individual speeds of sound in each wire, which in turn would depend upon a number of the physical properties, including density and shear deformation under shear stress. This is known as the shear modulus. These factors affect the transverse waves of the sound, whereas the longitudinal or compression wave component depend upon not only the shear modulus and density, but also compressibility, which is the reciprocal of the bulk modulus. So it is important to stress that the speed of sound in metals depends on more than just the density. As we can see from the chart, that although iron is the least dense of the five metals listed, it actually has the greatest speed for sound, most likely because it has the highest Young's modulus, which is also known as the modulus of elasticity, elasticity also being of great importance to the transmission of sound. On the other hand, gold is the next densest metal under platinum but actually has the lowest speed for sound at about 3240 meters per second. Nevertheless, as the document here implies, the metallic combination of gold, silver, and platinum were specifically chosen by Keeley as their actions on the sound speeds and resulting frequencies would have produced three different frequencies from one source. Frequencies which according to this document would have had a 369 ratio thus generating chords from each single note sounded from the source. We might also assume that a chord sounded from the source might produce even more complex chords. So again, instead of a single resonant frequency, it was the mass chord that was the medium through which Keeley claimed to operate his sympathetic force. Using this unique wire combination Keeley was apparently able to generate the necessary harmonics to perform astonishing feats of motivity, including making dense metallic grocer weights to rise and float in the water, to cause an eight pound model of an airship to rise, hover and descend in the air, to make a three ton steel spear to levitate, as well as to render a one ton steam engine as well as an iron cylinder of several hundred pounds light enough to be able to be lifted and moved with one hand. This force could also be apparently reversed to cause an increase in gravity or what we might call supergravity. But interestingly these accounts of Keeley's work are not the only accounts that refer to the use of three dissimilar metals as well as sound to nullify gravitation. In my video, Sonic Levitation and Acoustic Lubrication, did sound waves help to build the pyramids? I described an account of a levitation in Tibet involving scores of monks using a cacophony of huge musical instruments to levitate huge stones up the side of a steep cliff to build a temple. I also reimagined the process as a microscopic version of a containerless processing in which wave interference is used to stably levitate small objects in nodes or minimal zones of pressure. By manipulating the frequencies of the waves or the positioning of the sound sources and reflectors, the floating object can be controlled longitudinally as well as laterally. But there is a second account also located in Tibet that is no less fascinating. Reading from the document, Gravity and Antigravity by David Pratt, it says that the second Tibetan case 
involved an Austrian named Lenoir, who stated that while at a remote monastery in northern Tibet during the 1930s, he witnessed the demonstration of two curious sound instruments, which when used in concert could induce weightlessness in stone blocks. The first instrument was an extremely large gong that was three and a half meters in diameter, comprised of a central circular area of very soft gold, followed by a ring of pure iron, and finally a ring of extremely hard brass. When the gong was struck, it produced an extremely low dump sound, which ceased almost immediately. The second instrument was also comprised of three different metals, though the witness was not told what the three metals of this particular instrument were. But the instrument body had a half oval shape, kind of like a mussel shell, and was quite large at two meters long and one meters wide, with strings stretched longitudinally over its hollow cavity. Lanier was told that it emitted an inaudible resonance wave when the gong, the gong was struck. The two devices were used in conjunction with a pair of large screens, positioned so as to form a triangle configuration with them and directed towards a large stone block. When the gong was struck repeatedly with a large club to produce a series of brief low frequency sounds, the monk was then, then able to lift the heavy block with one hand. Lenari was told that this was how the Tibetan ancestors built protective walls around Tibet and that devices operating on simpler, uh, similar principles could be used to disintegrate matter. So again, we see an account describing the casting of three different metals in order to nullify the force of gravity but this time using gold, iron, and brass. And at least one of the instruments, instead of gold, silver, and platinum, as used in Keeley's wire. And again, we don't know if the same three metals were used in the string instrument, or if they were different. But in light of accounts of Keeley's wire, it might be reasonable to assume that the three different metals in each of the Tibetan instruments perform the same, same action of frequency multiplication as Keeley's trinuan wire allegedly did. Also, it does not seem obvious as to whether or not the weight reduction occurred only during the sound generation, or if the effect continued for some time after the initial stimulus. The latter condition of which has been described in Keeley's work Namely, namely when the levitated weights in the weights and jars experiment remained at the top of his jar even after the, the initial stimulus uh, died away. We might call this a latent energy or a latent effect as the weights would only descend when he played a different note. This concept of latent energy brings me to the work of Nikolai A. Kozirov an astronomer and also considered one of Russia's most promising astrophysicists during his time. Though bold and controversial in his thinking, Kozirov was respected by other prominent scientists of his time. His theoretical work involved what is called causal mechanics, in which he observed small but definite weight variations of objects when agitated by physical vibrations, shaking, heating, cooling, and rotation. He postulated that these effects were due to the presence of a spiraling flow of time energy, which can also be understood as tor torsion fields and torsion waves, essentially a twisting of the fabric of space. Though torsion fields are often associated with phenomena such as telekinesis and ESP, which are considered pseudoscience by the mainstream scientific community. The mainstream does, however, acknowledge the concept of torsion itself as any variable that involves rotation, though the term torsion is rarely used in modern scientific terminology. 
but using beam balances, Cozy Roof recorded and graphed weight changes in objects that were agitated by first balancing them on a beam. Then he would remove the objects, agitate them by shaking and vibrating them, and then placing the objects back on the beam, observing that the weight would be slightly higher than before. The scales would then show the weight of the object gradually decreasing, apparently releasing the extra energy that it had absorbed by being agitated. This gradual return to a resting state or resting weight is what was called a latent effect or a latent energy. Another of Kozirev's experiments involved gyroscopes which were not only rotated but also vibrated, heated, or conducting electricity in which the apparent weight would decrease. Another very interesting property in these experiments in addition to the latent energy is to quantize changes in the apparent weights. To quote the document here, in the vibration experiments on a balance, the weight reduction occurs stepwise, beginning with a certain vibration power. As the vibration frequency is further increased, the weight reduction at first remains the same and then again grows stepwise by the same value. It is further said that, depending on how we vibrate an object, we can either cause its weight to increase or decrease. The following graph shows quantized increases in weight with growing vibrational frequency. Kosura's work sounds very much like the discoveries made by John Worrell Keeley decades earlier. Keeley also noted that the flow of vibrational energy could be so directed as to increase or decrease the weight of an object. In my opinion, it seems that both Keeley and Kozirov were utilizing similar techniques and principles. However, Keeley seemed to have had a much greater command of this energy, having allegedly achieved significant weight reductions in heavy objects as well as full levitation. One of the key differences could have been due to Keeley's utilizations of very high frequency cores that were very finely tuned rather than low singular frequencies as denoted in the graph generated by Kozirev. Further, with his unique wire, Keeley was able to apparently provide a continuous supply of vibrational energy. This would seem to follow as we know from the simple example of a pushing of a swing that it takes a finite amount of time for the amplitude of energy to build up in the system. Depending on how this supply of vibrational energy was directed, it will also follow that the weight of the mass might be dramatically reduced such that it could be easily lifted or increased so much that it would sink into the flooring, both of which have been claimed in a number of Keeley's demonstrations. I will delve deeper into Kozirov's work and ideas in the upcoming video that I will entitle Alternative Theories of Gravitation and Levitation from the Ether to the Higgs Boson. But I wanted to briefly mention his work here to show that the ideas of harnessing vibration, rotation, and electromagnetism to modify gravity and perceived weight may be considered fringe ideas but are not entirely unsupported. Instead, they actually have empirical data that support them and have been reproduced independently on various occasions. So to recap, we know that sound can travel through wire. We've reasoned that sound can apparently be subdivided into subharmonics or vice versa. We know that there is both experimental and empirical evidence of the ability of vibration and other forms of agitation and energizing to modify friction and perceived gravity, the latter which manifests as quantized weight changes. It's really just a matter of ascertaining through continued experimentation as to how significant these weight changes can become. But to be scientific, we must also consider the well-documented fraud, fraud allegations 
against Keeley and his claims. As the wire in particular is described in the following referenced article published after his death to have not been solid but rather a fine hollow tube through which compressed air was conveyed as a fraudulent motive source. The hollow tube idea was brought up particularly in reference to Keeley's famous weights and jars experiments which I mentioned earlier. What had been assured by Keeley to be a solid wire was according to the bunkers actually a thin tube conveying compressed air. The claim was that the solid floating weights were actually hollow and very lightweight with openings in them arranged so that when air pressure was exerted on top of the water in the jar the water would be forced into the hollow weights and being made heavier would sink similar to a Cartesian diver. When the pressure was relieved the weight would rise or float. Other hollow tubes and globes similar to the fake wire were also claimed to have been used as conduits and reservoirs for compressed air as a hidden motive source in nearly all of Keeley's demonstrations. However, as far as is known, none of these alternative explanations were ever performed for a public audience to alleviate all doubt. A number of newspapers claimed that Keeley was a fraud and were very conclusive about it. In the book Free Energy Pioneer by author Theo Pageman, he, he reproduces a quote from a newspaper called The Press, which on January 9, 1899 said that Keeley used ordinary forces of nature, electrical, magnetic, chemical, pneumatic, and hydrostatic in his experiments has long been charged but never surely proved. I have to agree with this brief statement and actually the way I see it there are a number of arguments against Keeley being a complete fraud. I think that one of the main arguments against Keeley being a fraud is that his life did not show signs of luxurious or easy living. He was not a media darling nor did he seem to have an extensive social life, but instead toiled daily for hours on end in his workshop, attempting to harness the forces that he came to understand, both to satisfy his own curiosity and also to satisfy the expectations by the stakeholders in his company. Working with very subtle forces and precise acoustical frequencies, he had to outsource the construction of many of his devices and equipment to engineers who could construct the devices with optometrist-like precision. Keeley endured being constantly threatened with jail and lawsuits by the stakeholders of his company who were waiting for an exploitable product that Keeley failed to deliver on time. In fact, Keeley actually was jailed on at least one occasion for several days. He would sometimes go into fits of despair, once even saying that they could take his corpse to jail. He would sometimes destroy instruments and devices that had been the labor of years during fits of frustration, and on even on one occasion had contemplated suicide. It was during this most difficult time that he had met a woman named Clara Bloomfield Moore a kindly and wealthy widow who would be his financier and his greatest supporter for the rest of his life. Mrs. Moore offered Keeley a large sum of money during this most difficult time, yet he insisted to take only half of the amount. Yet it was still never easy for Keeley, as he confided in few people, which greatly added to his difficulty in being understood and trusted. He had to give regular demonstrations to the stockholders of the Keeley Motor Company and was often mocked by the media. He also suffered numerous injuries and in workshop explosions and mishaps that would sometimes lay him up for weeks. So of course none of this is any definitive proof, but it is highly unlikely that any fraudulent person would subject themselves to such 
a great quantity of continuous scrutiny and hardship for nearly 25 years. Though large-scale and long-term frauds certainly do exist, it would not behoove a single person to carry out a multi-million dollar charade for so long without benefiting from it in a very obvious way, either by living a lavish and extravagant lifestyle or simply co collecting, collecting a large portion of the money, creating an alias and disappearing to live a life of ease, neither of which Keeley did. So it begs the question as to why a person so entangled in a fraud, fraudulent scheme of such magnitude and complexity would subject themselves to such personal hardships and public scrutiny without planning a huge payout in a seamless escape plan. Instead, Keeley worked in his work workshop near the very end and died without being able to fully realize the success of his life's work, let alone any large fortune. Additionally, if we look at modern sonic technology, there are many parallels to accounts of Keeley's own acoustic technology. For instance, today we can use high frequency sound waves or ultrasound to atomize water in ultrasonic diffusers and humidifiers. This parallels Keeley's use of sound to change water into what he classified as etheric vapor. We have ultrasonic drilling which, like Keeley's devices, can drill through granite and other hard materials, such as diamond. We also have ultrasonic motors, which operate by, by vibrations of a stator against a rotor and maximize by resonance. Again, Keeley seemed to have had a similar idea once he abandoned trying to operate his motor via cavitation of water into ether and instead sought to develop his motor on the concept of vibratory sympathy. Acoustic levitation and acoustic microscopy are also among modern acoustic technologies, though the modern techniques greatly differ from those which Keeley was employing. Modern levitation, for instance, utilizes wave interference to, to create nodal regions within which small objects can stably float and containerless processing procedures. And it's more of a brute force technique utilizing sound pressure, whereas Keeley was using vibrations to act on the molecular properties of the object itself, as well as the energy surrounding the object to achieve levitation of multi-ton multi masses. And whereas our acoustic microscopy utilizes reflections of waves and measurements of phase differences in the reflection of the set waves to magnify and observe the fine details of objects, Keeley was using three wires, very likely his 21 gold, silver, and platinum wire, to act on the lens itself, greatly magnifying its optical properties via sympathetic vibrations. If the accounts of Keeley's work are true, then his acoustic technology back in the late 1800s was about 100 years ahead of our most current acoustic technology. One of the limiting factors of modern sonic technology is a lack of vibrational power as most sonic transducers and resonators can develop sonic pressures of only a certain order before shock waves develop, greatly dissipating that energy and inhibiting any further increases in power. But a company called Microsonics, Macrosonics, headed by Tim Lucas, has apparently solved that problem utilizing geometry. To quote the following article, scientists have long known that sound is composed of pulsating waves of energy, but it was considered useless as a power source because at high levels, sound waves distort into shock waves. But Tim Lucas, CEO of Microsonics, discovered that by sending the waves through containers of various shapes, the shock waves were eliminated. Once you've done that, he says, you can add all the energy, create all the pressure, and deliver all the power you want. He calls this invention Resonant Macrosonic Synthesis, or RMS. The geometric shape of the RMS resonators controls the shape of the waves, allowing for a synthesis of non-shocked waveforms, which in turn allows large amounts of energy to be added to the wave 
leading to extremely high dynamic pressures. Once an acoustic standing wave is formed, the resonator's geometry determines the resulting waveforms regardless of its amplitude. Now what's also interesting is that if we look at a couple of the transducers and resonators developed by microsonics, we might notice that they resemble the devices used by Keeley, only they are considerably smaller. So if geometry is indeed the answer to developing practical sonic energy densities, then it might appear that Keeley was also ahead of his time in this aspect as well. But a good question is, is how was Keeley able to bring together so many profound principles and disciplines? Well, according to the book Free Energy Pioneer, Keeley actually did not work completely alone, but was in regular contact with a number of what could be called techno-occultists or occult scientists and theosophists. Apparently, Philadelphia, where Keeley lived, was a hotbed of esoteric activity as well as a focal point of secret societies. In fact, the infamous occultist, Madame Blavatsky, lived in Philadelphia during Keeley's time and was keenly aware and interested in his work. Being well connected in the occult underground circles, she rallied much interest in Keeley, linking him to esoteric doctrines and ideas and referring to him specifically in her 1888 book, The Secret Doctrine. Apparently, these techno-occultic societies even provided information and ideas that gave Keeley an enhanced a theoretical foundation for much of his later work. Consequently, Keeley's developing work apparently also inspired a lot of earlier science fiction writings. We know this is a regular occurrence in general as reality inspires fiction and fiction reality in an endless loop of inspiration and philosophical solidarity. We might even wonder if these techno-occultists were actually a reservoir of knowledge preserved and passed down from the builders and priests of ancient times. Ultimately, I am firmly convinced that everything that is accomplished by electromagnetism can also be accomplished by sonics and that a technology based on sympathetic vibrations could potentially supersede or at the very least greatly complement and enhance our present technological development opening up our world to a host of practical phenomena. Keeley's story is a complex one and still very much shrouded in mystery. My personal opinion is that Keeley did both observe and exercise a certain degree of control over various acoustical phenomena. But like Nikola Tesla, he seemed to not be very interested in the financial and business aspects of invention, but instead reveled and exploration in this discovery aspects. He also didn't seem to be very good at following timetables, even those set by himself. He may also not have always had the complete skill set to fully realize his ideas, traits often shared by many other inventive minds. I also believe that he had a penchant for making grandiose claims that he may have seen as being ideologically within his grasp, but still out of his physical reach at the time. But I do not believe that he did so deliberately to deceive, but rather to buy himself the time to perfect his experiments and to bring his incredibly complex visions to fruition. Companies are often guilty of this as well, even going so far as to fudge numbers and other data in the attempt to temporarily satisfy stakeholders and to buy time, fully expecting that what is promised will eventually be delivered. It's not the most honest thing to do, of course, but it's certainly not unheard of. But as already discussed, I believe that the accusations of outright fraud against Keeley were unfounded. And as we know all too well, the narratives given us by society are often ill-informed, premature, and too often and too easily manipulated. Considering these revelations, I believe there is ample reasonable doubt 
to be skeptical of claims of fraud against Keeley and that his work is long overdue a second look.